Okay, shall we uh, have a word of prayer before we start? Our dear Heavenly Father, again, we continue to study your word. We want to grow by feeding on the spiritual manna that comes from your holy writings. You speak to us through this book, and we need your spirit to enlighten our hearts and our minds and make us susceptible to your influence so that we can obey you faithfully and joyfully. And may we be greater witnesses of yours so that people may know about the great controversy and how the gospel is uh, winning and triumphing over the forces of darkness. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, I believe you already know from what perspective we are reviewing our fundamental beliefs. And according to our author, when uh, the General Conference had its 58th uh, session or meeting, they uh, amended our set of fundamental beliefs. An additional one was added. Uh, actually, it is just a re-explanation of what we already know. Uh, pertaining to growing in Christ, pertaining to sanctification, but this time being viewed from the theme or picture of the great controversy, which is a very distinctive teaching and contribution of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I had been very happy studying the books of Ellen G. White, showing us that uh, there is a big battle going on, war going on, we uh, do not uh, know what's really happening around us. It's only the Word of God that tells us that these beings, these invisible powers are existing. And the war is not on gaining oil fields or mines or even territories. But the goal is for precious souls to be what? Obtained by both forces. And we know these two forces that are warring against each other. We have God and we have the forces of darkness, Satan and the demons. All right. Is this how you view the world? Is this your worldview? Yeah, I remember my uh, brother was a doctor when a terrible marital uh, problem uh, occurred in their home. He said, that this is only uh, uh, something that is being done by uh, Satan in order to destroy his family. That's how he looked at it. He did not condemn the guilty sinner, but he uh, viewed her as victim only of satanic forces that are trying to deceive the one who is victimized and destroy the rest of the family members. That's why he said he is willing, he's willing to allow himself to uh, be used by God for forgiveness to come in, reconciliation to come in, because he knows that there is actually a battle raging on. And this conflict is very tense, very intensive, because they are warring for, for uh, the most important thing here on earth, and that is our souls, okay? All right. Let, let me go back to the previous studies in order to show how extensive this uh, great controversy is. And when we talk of sin, which is actually the big, 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 big problem, we see sin affecting God. Who else is being affected by sin? Humankind. All right, humankind. Man. Mankind. Who else? All right. The universe. Not just this world, but the entire universe. The extensive expanse of the universe, the planets, the galaxies, the many and fallen worlds, according to Ellen G. White, have been affected by the rebellion that occurred in heaven when Lucifer uh, transgressed the law of God and tried to uh, overthrow God's government. And of course, this affects Satan favorably, huh? And the demons favorably. Okay. In what way does sin 
affect God? How is God affected by the occurrence of sin? Yeah? Why did he have to uh, overthrow yes. Satan and cast him out? He has to expel Satan. Yeah, why did he have he has to do that? It was, it was an open rebellion. Obvi okay, so rebellion against his government, challenged his authority, all right? Open and dishonored his name. Yes. God's name. Challenge God's government and law. His law of love. But what is important is his name. He is supposed to be a loving God. He is supposed to be what? Somebody who does not control people against their will. He is somebody who is liberal and democratic. And his laws are not burdensome. They are good. And they promote our welfare. But that was challenged by Satan. All right. How was uh, mankind uh, affected by sin? Hmm? When, uh, man, when uh, to the death. How, 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 how? Sin like corrupted mankind. Right? Mm -hmm. Sin condemned mankind. What else? Sin controlled mankind. In other words, we have the problem of penalty of sin, which is death. We have the problem of the power of sin. And we also have the problem of the presence of sin. Okay, I'm enumerating this because if we understand the extensive effect of sin, we will see that there is no other solution to this kind of problem. No man can ever resolve this issue. Only as big as God can resolve the issue. That's why I'm presenting it on the board. That everything was actually affected adversely by the presence of sin. And of course, sin does not contradict Satan or the demons. In fact, it cooperates with sin. Because this is the very tool that Satan uses in order for him to have control over Everybody over everything and even control of death. He uses sin in order to impose death on everything that was created by God because he hates God. What we are seeing here is that everybody got affected by the occurrence and existence of sin. How about the universe? There is the threat of what? Contamination. All right, because there are still unfallen intelligent beings who are watching when the rebellion occurred and they were asking what would God do and could Satan be right in all his accusations or charges against God. Okay, so we see here forces trying to win over the battle and I show you, do you know of any solution that can ever solve everything? All the consequences, all the effects, all the power brought by sin. Do you see of any solution? Salvation. Yeah, just one. We need only somebody who is really bigger than the sin problem. And he must be as big as God. And it's good we have God who took the initiative in order to do something about it. Okay? So in other words... Appeared, what? The cross. No, I maintain the sin. Okay? S-I-N. I maintain it. But this time, this is about the cross of salvation. The cross of salvation. All right. How did the cross solve the sin issue? How? All right, we have to understand this because now we are trying to, un to study 
our fundamental beliefs from the perspective of the great controversy. What is going to be the title of the next lesson? Growing in Christ. Do you see the great controversy in that topic, growing in Christ? Do you see the great controversy there? Okay, that is how, what we're going to discover. Where is the picture of great controversy in the matter of us being ex expected by God to grow in Christ's likeness, which is only possible by growing in Christ? So that is the main point of the lesson next week. You are going to grow in Christ. How do you see yourself? In that picture of great controversy, how does it work? We better understand how it works in terms of the great controversy theme. All right. So that is actually the burden of the author that he wants to teach us so that when we look at the demand of God that we are to be sanctified, that we are to be filled by the Holy Spirit, that we are to bear fruit that will bring glory to his name, we know how it works because it doesn't work just like what sowing seeds and making the, that seed uh, those seeds to grow first the blade and then the ear and then of course the fruit etc etc no we've got to see satan what is he doing we got to see the holy spirit what is he doing and why can we grow in christ when in fact there is the devil there is the there are the demons they are the forces opposing our growth. How can that happen? Okay? Do you get what I mean? All right, all right. We will have to study that conflict. And we are now concentrating on this. Why? Okay, first. Because according to George Barna Group, the New York Times in reporting on a survey by the Barna Group noted the diminishing belief in the devil among Americans. Two-thirds of Americans do not believe in the devil as a living entity. In a nationwide telephone survey of 1,007 randomly selected people, pollsters ask whether they agree that Satan is not a living being but a symbol of evil. All right? They ask 1,000 people. If they believe Satan was only a symbol of evil and not really a living entity. The answers, 62% agreed with the statement that Satan is only a symbol of evil. Not a real person, not a real cre creature with uh, supernatural powers and wicked intelligence, but merely a symbol of of evil. Okay? 62%. 30% disagreed. Probably they were Christians who studied the Bible. And 8% did not have any opinion. They did not know. They did not know. Only Seventh-day Adventists really talk about the great controversy. At times I would read books written by Protestants and would find them mention about it but not really as elaborate as uh, what Adventists has produced in order to explain the great picture from the very beginning up to the end. Why there's going to be a millennium, why there was a crucifixion, why Moses was called in order to liberate people. We see the forces of heaven fighting against the forces of evil in those stories. That's why we are really blessed with a messenger for the remnant who is guiding us to have more spiritual eyes in the sense that we are able to see the hidden powers that are really behind the occurrences that we uh, witness around us. Okay? All right. So, now, has Satan been defeated already? Hmm? Okay, we will go to that, but this is very interesting. Okay. According to doctors at the Good Samaritan Regional Medical Center in Phoenix, Arizona, rattlesnakes thought to be dead can still strike, bite, and kill you. Decapitate a rattlesnake, 
that decapitated head can actually still kill within 60 minutes because it has reflexes to bite within an hour and still do it in order to maim and then kill or poison a victim. Now, if you say that Satan was already defeated by Jesus Christ on the cross, how come he's still alive? And how come he's still able to hurt people? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So now, we are going to talk about you, me, us growing in Christ. All right? Against the forces of evil that is trying to reign over us and control us to the power of sin. All right. Let us erase this. Oh, by the way, were we able to uh, answer how the cross was able to uh, contradict the effects of sin? All right. Maybe we should do that. All right. Through the cross, the penalty is solved by justification. All right. Jesus Christ died for us, so you don't have to suffer the penalty of death. Yeah, and by his death, he is able to justify you, meaning that you are no longer a criminal, you are a righteous person. In fact, you are full of good deeds, and therefore you need not be condemned. Sin no longer has power to condemn you. Secondly, sin no longer has power to reign in your life or over you. Why? Because through the process of sanctification, also provided by the cross, meaning because of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit can now come to us and provide the righteousness that God expects of us. Sanctification. And about the presence. Well, when will the presence of sin be removed? Completely. Huh? When? Glorification. When Jesus Christ comes back. And in the after the millennium, he's going to destroy the devil and his angels and then make this all the heaven and all the earth into something new all right not just remodel the earth not just repair the earth this will be replaced by a new one so there will be glorification and the presence of sin will be gone all right he solved that how about satan ah this is the focal point of our study Okay, in Genesis chapter 3, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. Okay, his heel will be wounded. Was Jesus Christ wounded? Yes. Did he die? Yes, but not permanently. Because he rose again. So in other words, the one who trampled on the head of the, spirit, of the serpent is still alive and he is in victory, living in victory. All right, how about Satan? Well, let us read some, some text, all right? Let us read some text. John, chapter... First John, chapter 3, verse 8. Verse 8. First John, chapter 3, verse 8. Okay. Anyone? Read it, please. First John chapter 3, verse 8. First John, first John, sorry. Not the Gospel of John. First John. Anybody has found it? The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Was Jesus Christ successful? Okay, let's read. Hebrews chapter... 2 verse 14. We better check the Bible if what we assert is true. Okay. Was he successful? Okay. 14 and 15. Okay. 
Anyone? Okay. Jesus Christ became man. And then he died. And through his death, he was able to kill and destroy the enemy. And because he has defeated the enemy, he is able to liberate or release those who are controlled by the fear of death. Because they know they're going to die because they know that they are sinners. And the wages of sin is what? Death. In other words, Jesus Christ died and through his death, he was able to defeat the enemy. How did he do that? Can somebody explain it? How was the death of Jesus Christ able to destroy Satan, the enemy? How? Because Jesus died the second death. Okay, the penalty of sin is already paid for. All right. Okay. Very good. Okay, that's right. Okay. So in other words, Satan can no longer bring death to people, especially to those who believe in Jesus Christ. He no longer can overpower the believers with death simply because somebody already died for them. They will no longer die. But then let us say there are people who accepted Jesus Christ and therefore Satan no longer has power over them to bring them the fear of death because they are no longer going to die. Because there is resurrection, so death will only be a temporary sleep and therefore there is no longer fear of death. So Jesus Christ was able to defeat the devil in that uh, aspect. Okay? And we will continue. We will continue. All right. How about the universe being contaminated? There is the threat of sin, what? Spreading. Spreading. But that was already cut off by the cross of Jesus Christ. Why? What happened? Simply because the watching world, the watching world. <laughs> yeah, it, it, sin is contained in this, uh, on this earth. Simply because the watching world now understand the true nature of Satan's claims and charges or accusations against God. Now they understand the true love and authority of God. Now they see God as who really is. He really is. And they now understand the great controversy. So they won't choose anymore the side of Satan and the works of Satan. So at least the threat of contamination is contained only here and the other worlds are now safe and protected because they saw what happened on Mount Calvary. The true picture of Satan was unmasked and the true picture of God being a loving father has been exposed and revealed <coughs> to mankind and to the rest of the universe. All right. How about the name of God? His name will be vindicated because in the end, everybody will understand who is on the wrong and who is in the right. Right? Okay, how about his law of love? Well, Jesus Christ already obeyed the law, the law of God. And he showed how it is to be obeyed. Through the motive of love, gratitude, and thanksgiving to God, who is the source of this kind of love. So in other words, all this have been solved by the cross of Jesus Christ. And therefore, this now can be addressed. And this one is interested in bringing you down, in tempting you. He doesn't want you to progress in spirituality and sanctification. He wants to tempt you many, many times or even bring trials, difficulties, and suffering so, so you will get discouraged and will, you will lose hold of the garment of Jesus Christ and the promises of the Lord and you will fail and once you make your final choice you will suffer the destiny that is prepared for Satan and his wicked angels okay so let us now look at this aspect and we will uh, follow step by step the uh, logic that is being presented by our theologian 
who is the author of our quarterly, okay? This is lesson number five. Okay, lesson number five. Growing in Christ. Controversy between God. Bang. Bang. Satan. At stake is the world. Take is the world. All right. And Satan was able to capture the world. Because we follow the works of the devil, because we do the works of the devil, we are slaves of the devil according to the text that we just read. Huh, Brother Adrian? Yes. <laughs> okay. Because we are doing the works of Satan, therefore we belong to to Satan and if we belong to Satan we are his children he is our father according to Jesus Christ and not just children of Satan we are slaves of the wicked master so in other words slaves of Satan that became the condition of man when Adam and Eve fell into sin Okay, so according to the Bible, if we are slaves of Satan, he is our master and we are his servants. We do what he wants. We follow what he commands. Okay, if you are a slave, how can you be freed from your master? Huh? Praise the ransom. Very good. This is a very important word. The payment of a ransom, which in Greek is lutron, okay? And the process is called redemption. What is redemption? You are a slave. You cannot free yourself. You need external help to be liberated. Somebody stronger, somebody wealthier, somebody richer who can afford to buy you from your former master and let you become his own servant, not in the way of unrighteousness, but this time in the way of righteousness. And therefore, our lesson says this is actually what God did. Being slaves of Satan, there is a price to be paid. We cannot pay for our liberty and freedom. God decided He's going to pay the fee. All right? And this kind of ransom is what? Sacrificial ransom. Because he had to pay it with his life. Do we find the text? Okay, let's read the text. Mark 10, 45. Mark 10, 45. Okay, so here comes the cross, and the process is redemption. All right. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. All right. He did not come in order to be served, but he came to serve. He even gave his life as a ransom for many. How many? All. The entire world. Okay, it should be all. All right? All right. Okay, another text, another text. John chapter 15, verse 3. John chapter 15, verse 3. Somebody please uh, open. John 15, 3. You were already clean because of the word which was spoken to you. Oh? John 15, 3. 
Must be 13. Huh? Let me see. Let me check. Let me check. John 15, 13. No. Sorry. Yeah? Leo? Greater love no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus Christ was speaking when he was already preparing for his arrest and for his crucifixion. So in other words, Jesus, the Son of God, decided because we cannot extricate ourselves from this slavery that he would pay the price with a sacrifice and that is his life given for us all. Do you get it? And if we go to John 1, 29, we hear John the Baptist saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Why Lamb of God? Because the Lamb is being used as means of sacrifice. Life being laid on the altar for the sake of the sins of those who offered the Lamb. So in other words, there is the idea of redemption and the price is very exorbitant. Far, far exorbitant than man can ever imagine because the life of Jesus Christ is infinite. And it is able to cover all sins and all men and all sinners who want to receive his salvation. Okay? All right. Now, you are now redeemed. You are now redeemed. You are supposed to be somebody belonging now to a new master. All right. Where is Satan there? Satan is still alive and he would not stop to keep on claiming you. He will tempt you. He will bring you wealth, riches. If you cannot uh, be uh, strayed through the presence of prosperity, he will bring you poverty. If not poverty, difficulty, trials, troubles. And he will use all kinds of systems. Political, social, marital, all kinds of relationships. These are actually the elements being spoken of in Romans chapter 8. Principalities, powers, etc., etc. Maybe we should look at uh, those very important words to show how the devil is try really trying everything, every means, in order to destroy us and claim us back from Jesus Christ. Okay? Romans chapter 8, verse 38 of 8 from the book of Romans. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor death nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The translation is powers in other places or in other translations. It is principalities, meaning chief of leaders. It can be human, secular leaders, yeah. but it can also refer to supernatural beings with leadership and power. Okay? All right. So in other words, there is still the attempt for us to be withdrawn from Jesus Christ. However, what helps us understand our victory in Christ? Because Jesus Christ was victorious here on the cross. His victory can be our victory. On the condition... That you remain in Christ, apart from Jesus Christ, and outside of Him, we can never grow victorious. We cannot grow victoriously. Okay, here is an explanation. All right, if we want to understand how we can grow from one victory to another as we stay in Christ, okay? 
when you uh, stay in Christ, meaning you, you mean you are united with Christ. You are united with Jesus Christ. What does it mean? You go to Romans chapter 6. So in other words, the whole explanation you find in the book of Romans, particularly chapter 6. And, and Romans 6 has three parts. Number 1, verses 1 to 11. Number 2, verses 12 to 14. And lastly, 3, 15, up to the end. And the first part is about baptism. Hmm. Interesting. What is the background of Romans chapter 6? Some people are saying, aha, if we sin, grace abounds. If sin increases, grace abounds more. So if you want to produce more grace, you should produce more? Yeah, that's what they said. That's what they said. You want to experience more grace? You do more sins. All right? Because where sin increases, grace doth more abound. Okay? That is their uh, reasoning. So they said, what Paul is teaching us is allowing us to commit more sins because if we commit more sins, God's love and God's grace pours more abundantly so that we can be forgiven, so that we can still be loved, so that we can live a happy, joyful life of wickedness and sin. <laughs> Yeah, because no, you can never outgive God. All right. Always, always far and beyond what you are able to do. All right. So, in other words, he gives the doctrine of baptism. What is the doctrine of baptism? When you accepted Jesus Christ, you were united with Jesus Christ, and when you were united, you died with Him. When he died on the cross, you also died. If you already died, what happened to your old person? The old man. It already died. And if you are dead, how can you sin? Sin can no longer be your master because whatever command he gives you, you will not be able to do. Because you will not hear the temptation. You will not obey the words. You can't do anything that is being commanded by sin. Because you're already dead. Okay. Okay. When we, when we read this part of the book of Romans, this is true baptism. So in other words, baptized in water through the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you are united with Christ, he says, you already died. But because Jesus Christ resurrected, you are raised into a new life. The old has gone, the new has come. You are now a new creation. You are now ready to walk in the newness of life. Will you be able to overcome sin if you are united with Christ? Yeah. Okay, wait a minute. Okay. <laughs> we will uh, get to that. We will get to that. Okay. Yes. That's right. That's right. That's right. You know? Not in your soul, Sin, but you're still living this flesh and body that hasn't been saved yet. So you can still sin. Yes. Yeah, you can still sin. You need not sin. You, uh, okay, okay. Uh, you know the key? The key is actually in uh, verse 11. Let's go to 11. Okay. Before you could not resist sin. Now you can resist sin. It cannot reign over you anymore. Okay? Before you cannot. 
You're a slave of sin. Whatever he commands, you do. This time, you can fight back, not through your own power, but through the power of Jesus Christ with whom you united yourself. All right? If you are really always connected with Jesus Christ and you follow verse 11, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. What do you mean count yourselves? Reckon yourselves. This word is very important. Suppose I tell Sister Anita, this is uh, an instant illustration. I tell her, Sister Anita, you are actually an old auntie of Bill Gates. And did you know that a billion dollar had actually depo been deposited to your account? Okay, you can do anything, spend as, uh, as much as you want, and you are already covered by the wealth of Bill Gates. All right, what are you going to do now? Yeah. If some bill collectors start uh, collecting, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Start collecting, you will no longer be afraid because you treat yourself as the old auntie of Bill Gates. I cannot uh, be afraid of any bill collector running after me or chasing after me. I am sufficient. Because somebody said, I am an old auntie, and he is already covering everything that I have as liabilities, right? I have more assets than my uh, liabilities. You treat yourself as somebody who's rich. In other words, here comes Satan, and he tempts you. You tell him, no, I'm already dead. You cannot tempt me. I am God's son. You have no power over me. Scrum. That should be your attitude whenever something comes to you. And also you can say, I am washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. I am justified every moment. So in other words, when I die and if I die now, I can be sure I will get to heaven when Jesus Christ comes. I'm clean. See what I mean? You reckon you treat yourself the way that the Lord teaches you, that you are now a child of God, justified, ready, anytime, all right? And you can defeat the devil because you are his son and Jesus Christ empowers you to defeat him. How do you tell that with this verse in First John, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves <coughs> and, the, and the truth is not in us? Yeah. How do you that? Yeah, we know that the sinful nature is still uh, within us, all right? We know that we are still weak, yes. That's why we still need the justifying blood of Jesus Christ. And we fall from time to time, right? But we need not remain defeated. We can fight that sin. Of course, we do not rely on our own efforts, and uh, we always bank on the safety net of what? Justification. Unlike before, if uh, the master tells us, commit murder, tell a lie, huh? watch pornography, be vicious, be immoral, take revenge, we easily get swayed by that powerful command of the darkness. But now we can resist if we know our own position, justified by the blood of Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit can possess you in order to fight with a perfect heart all the temptations that come in your way. You know what I mean? Don't you experience victory at times? Huh? We cannot claim perfection or inerrancy, but we can claim, claim what? Progress in sanctification. And I think we need not remain in willful what? Willful uh, sinning and commission of wrongdoing. Okay? We don't claim. We don't claim you that we are perfect in the sense that we are absolute per perfect. Are but perfect. relatively, we can claim perfect in the sense that we have a heart that really submits ourselves to God. 
before the scene is a normality. Now the scene is a uh, something abnormal it's, it's an that you resist. Event. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. It's a different direction. It's a different trend, and it is a different experience. Now you are an obedient God, uh, servant of God or child of God. So we are now Relatively perfect, not absolutely perfect. From sin unto death. Yeah, that, right? that that's right. Is, uh, you are not uh, so sinning. Sin. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But your, uh, the sins that commit are sins not unto death. Right. Because... <laughs> Binyal, Binyal <laughs> sin. <laughs> so, okay. So if I was a true believer, when I sin, sin should actually grieve me. Yeah. It grieves you. It should grieve me. You feel sorry, and you come to God, confess your sin, and you ask for forgiveness, and you claim power so that you can overcome the habit, all right, and you can walk in righteousness. It's possible. We don't have to remain defeated. Only let us not be arrogant and confident that we are absolutely perfect. No. Our heart can be perfect in the eyes of God. Mature spiritually because we are inclined in uh, obeying God and following His will. Okay? All right. Uh, where now? If we go to the next section... Our lesson says, the emphasis here is being used as tools or instruments of righteousness. All right. Instruments or tools of righteousness or unrighteousness. You offer a part of your body as instrument of righteousness, according to Paul. If you don't, you're actually offering the part of your body to, as instrument of unrighteousness. Sometimes the translation is weapon instead of instrument. All right, what is the big difference? Weapons of righteousness, weapons of unrighteousness. Tools or instruments of righteousness, tools or instruments of righteousness. What's the big difference? Yeah, so there is the picture of battle, of war, warfare, right? And I like uh, this more. Offering ourselves as weapons of righteousness in order to defeat unrighteousness. Being used by God. And the last one is about being a slave to God. So again, the figure or uh, the analogy of slavery. And I told you, because of redemption, we are no longer slaves of Satan. We are now slaves to God. We follow him. He is now our master. So we need not live in sin. We can grow mat to maturity and spiritual uh, progress by remaining in Jesus Christ. And Romans 6 is a very good source in order to explain to us different kinds of pictures that will uh, elaborate on our condition as one who is being protected and being nurtured and made to grow by the presence of Jesus Christ. Uh, but uh, there is a difference here in slavery uh, for Satan and slavery for Okay, Christ. there is a big difference. What's the difference? Well, Satan is treating you as a slave, but uh, God is treating you as a uh, recover you know son he's like the prodigal son like the prodigal son i should be, should be one of your servants he's coming as uh -huh. he's begging his father to take him as a slave, slave yeah he's not taking him as a slave he is considering him as a son oh uh, okay Christ. here that is slavery to god yes yes we are but willing yeah. slaves but he's still not treating us as slaves <laughs> yes, they, they <laughs> yeah 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 okay uh okay. Okay, because during the time of Paul, slavery is uh, being yeah. just a possession or property. Your life and uh, your death uh, are in the hands of uh, your master. You don't even have rights, right? So there is absolute obedience to the one who gives you the command. So that is 
what is being highlighted by the use of the word, you are slave to God. Meaning absolutely, His will is what is paramount and important in your life. That you want always to obey God's uh, commands every moment of your life. Okay, so that's uh, Romans chapter 6. So do we see here the battle? Yes. The great controversy. And Jesus Christ was able to release us through the process of redemption. Wherein he paid the ransom. So that now we are under a new manage management, a new master. And this master is Jesus Christ with whom we unite ourselves. And for us to understand how we are to grow in him, Romans 6 gives us a wonderful explanation. We need not be mastered by sin because we are no longer its slave. Okay? We can be victorious. We can be victorious. We have a new life. Reckon yourself as somebody who is a new creation, as somebody who is a new, uh, a new uh, servant of a new master. Okay? All right? Okay, let me read something here uh, regarding uh, Satan. Satan, according to this uh, item, is carnivorous. <laughs> Satan is carnivorous. He is a serpent trying to deceive God's people. Genesis 3, 1, 2. He is a bird trying to despoil God's harvest. Matthew 13. He is a wolf trying to defeat God's flock, John 10, 12. He is a lion trying to devour God's children, 1 Peter 5, 8. And he is a dragon trying to destroy God's son, Revelation 12, 1 to 9. Now, Satan is also a counterfeiter. Satan has his own trinity, the devil, the beast, and the false prophet. He has his own church called Synagogue of Satan, Revelation 2.9. He has his own ministers. Hmm. <laughs> what denomination is this? <laughs> ministers of Satan, 2 Corinthians 11.4-5. He has formulated his own system of theology, doctrines of demons, 1 Timothy 4.1. He has established his own sacrificial system, the Gentile sacrifice to demons, 1 Corinthians 10, 20. He has his own Lord's Supper, communion service, the cup of demons and the table of demons mentioned in 1 Corinthians 10, 21. His ministers proclaim his own gospel, a gospel contrary to that which we have preached to you, Galatians 1, 7 to 8. So uh, beware. He is real. He is just around us constantly. Stalking behind us, all right? Be careful, but don't be afraid because he is already a defeated foe. As long as we are in Christ, he cannot touch us. We will be free from his wiles and temptations since we are following the will of Christ. Okay? All right, any question? Satan is a person. Yeah, 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 that's right. They are spirits, meaning just like wind. They come powerful, but you do not see them. All right, but they can manifest themselves through uh, different forms. That's why he used the serpent. He became visible to Adam and Eve, right? And even angels would come in the form of men. Yeah. When the angels uh, met with uh, Abraham, when God was planning to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, yeah, yeah he can manifest himself. He can manifest as a light angel. Yeah. And yeah, yeah in, in fact, he will uh, counterfeit the, the second coming of Jesus Christ. As an angel of light. Yes. What kind of light? <laughs> Glorious <laughs> light. <laughs> Visible light. Visible light. Shining light. Shining light. Shining light. Shining light. Shining light. 
Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So in other words, when we come to God to seek His power and His help so that we can walk in the way of righteousness and sanctification, we should really cry to God, help us, because we have a, a, a big boa or a anaconda just around us ready to constrict us and destroy us. Keep us in the safety of Jesus Christ and in His blood. Amen? Amen. All right. There is victory. That victory is in Christ. It is already available. Satan is already a defeated foe. We should not fear him, but we should be careful unless we become boastful and confident to live the safe, what? Fence of Christ's protection. Okay. Let's pray. I will have to go. Uh, Brother Rufo, please. Holy Father, we thank you so much for being with us. I thank you, Father Lord. Help us, Father, to understand that uh, we are in a basic contest. Amen. Father, that we submit our lives to you, that you lead in Christ, so that we'll be an overcomer at the same time, a doer of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.